introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Tisha Lee, who is the Executive Director of the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, uh, otherwise known as TAF. Um, she's been in that position and here in the community for 11 years. And um, if you're like me, and I, I should know more about TAF, and you think, well, that's the taste of Tippecanoe. Or that, sadly, is, is, is where those beautiful light fixtures were vandalized and, and, and one was taken. But there, there's more to it than the Wells the old Wells Library, there's more to it than their one special event, and that's what Tisha's going to talk to all of us about today, so please help me welcome her. Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you about the Tippecanoe Arts Federation. Just as a, um, a general thing for me, who all has heard about the Tippecanoe Arts Federation before? Thank you all. So we were founded in 1976, actually as an arts calendar, and have since grown to meet the growing needs of not only our local constituents, but also our new regional scope which occurred in 1997 when we became a regional arts partner to the Indian Arts Commission, which is our state agency. We are housed in the historic Wells Library. It was built in 1926. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we were very sad to find out that, uh, unfortunately, someone uh, was in a point of their life that they felt that they needed to steal and to, to get some money. Uh, we are, though, fortunate enough to have found uh, someone who is a metal worker that is recasting those for us. Wow. Wow. Uh, so we are planning on dedicating those lights as well as the newly renovated building in, um, in March. So just in the next month and we're very much looking forward to it. The building for those of you who um, had not known, we started a construction pro uh, program just about a year ago to renovate the full interior of the building to bring it up to the 21st century. We actually, um, and, and I say that, uh, but but it was true. I mean, everything was, was still stuck in 26. But, um, so we moved through abatement twice, and uh, if you guys know about that, that's lead, that's uh, asbestos, that's all that fun stuff. We got that all out of there and actually um, updated it with a new HVAC unit. It is really something, and I hope you all can, can join us as we reopen the building for the next and for the future of the organization. So uh, we are headquartered right here in Lafayette, but as uh, we do serve a 14-county region, we are Region 4, oops, um, region 4, which is the largest geographic space in Indiana. The Indian Arts Commission is our state agency, as I mentioned. They receive funds from the National Endowment for the Arts, which is our national and federal body. And like the other 49 states, we all have a designated state commission or council. And in 1997, they decided that the most equitable way to distribute dollars, these taxpayer dollars, was to identify uh, regional arts partners to be the soldiers on the ground to ensure that we would be able to get those dollars to all of the taxpayers. So that's our main role, but we also serve several other, uh, and we provide services for, for a number of different organizations that exist throughout our region. Now, the Federation is actually composed of over 200 arts organizations and artists, and um, they receive the technical assistance grants making, information referral services, and of course the community <coughs> cultural plan from us. And we do that on a regular basis to ensure that we are ro robust in terms of the provisions that we are providing for each of our constituents. We have a, a, a set of very ingrained programs that started before I did, and one of them is our gallery walk. We are celebrating year number 15 of the gallery walk, and this is an activation between our local arts community as well as our business sector to really highlight downtown. Uh, it's, it, it's a real um, enjoyment for, for, for many folks. We usually have about 3,000 people at each gallery walk. 
We also have a fantastic exhibition series. We have approximately 18 shows every year, and in part, um, this came along when we became the sole owners of the building. So we feature beginning and intermediate artists that are in their career that are looking to move beyond um, a library or a coffee shop to show their artwork and become professional artists. We also have two major events that we do. There's TAP, which is coming up on April 6th of this year. It's a craft beer festival, and it happens at the top of the Tippecanoe County parking garage. The funds that we raise here also go back into all of our programs. And of course, as Chef mentioned, we also do the Taste of Tippecanoe. It's turning 38 this year, which is also older than the rest of the employees that work at TAP. <laughs> that, that makes me, me feel good that I, I started out being the youngest and now I'm the oldest. <laughs> um, but we're very excited this year because uh, we have the footprint that is going to remain in downtown because the other two major festivals have gone away. It's incumbent upon us to make sure that we, ha we have a continual presence and showcase all of the arts disciplines that the, the talented individuals in our region are really going to showcase at this event. Annually, we're bringing in about 30,000 individuals to the event. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, about the programs that mean the most to me. And the After School Arts program, which you all sponsored, and thank you so much, is the program that really resonates with me because um, as a youth myself, I um, grew up in a very poor household and had it not been for an arts council similar to the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to really engage in the arts. We have a lot of arts and cultural entities here, but for many of them, in order to take a class, it is you have to pay. So this, this opportunity comes to us because as an arts council, we're not restricted to a specific discipline. We represent the visual arts, but we also represent the performance, literary, and culinary arts. So each of our students that take part in these classes, they get to get all of that exposure. And in a small classroom setting, with, with teachers that are actually professional um, and we always pay our artists um, and this is a way that they are able to, to give back. Um, we began this program because my office in the former Wells, which is now being renovated, but um, had a great view of the dumpster. <laughs> so uh, I did have a window but it did overlook the dumpster. And there, uh, the one day I was just hearing a lot of noise and of course you know I poked my head out and there were these young people who were just playing in our dumpster. And we're within steps of Centennial Park in the downtown and just down the street from the YWCA and they were insisting on playing with our cardboard boxes that we had put in there. And that was really the impetus for this program to provide a drop-in center, a safe place for young people who like me grew up and was a latchkey kid maybe only had one parent at home, but needed something to keep them busy in a good, positive way. Because with the absence of this, we can get in a lot of trouble. I know that because I did get into some trouble when I didn't have the arts in my life. Um, but uh, again, this is our 10th year of having this program. Uh, we've had a lot of success with it. We serve over 700 students each year. The program has been so successful that continually, each of the classes that we make available are filled and we also have a waiting list. This year we've also gotten a lot of requests to do a summer camp. And that's something that we haven't always wanted to do because we do know that some of our arts partners offer that. But as we look forward to the growth of that program, we want to make sure that the summer, summer hours are taken as well. So in order to facilitate that, we're, we're, um, uh, we're having the children paint with our artists that are coming in for our mural festival. Sorry about that. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this program continues to grow, and when we first had an art exhi exhibition opening for this, we only had about maybe 25 or 50 people. This program has grown so much that we have over uh, 300 people that attend the reception annually. The other program that we have is the Outreach Instrument Lending Library. So we were um, very blessed to have received an award from the North Central Health Services and they provided us with funds so that we could purchase instruments that were needed by young people who participate in band or orchestra in Tippecanoe, Clinton, and Warren County. So these are all young people who are enrolled in those classes, but they're also on free and reduced school lunch. 
and as many of you know, children are fickle. One minute they want to play the flute, the next minute they want to play the drums. And this can be extremely expensive and even putting up a, a barrier for them. And this program has enabled us to get instruments into the hands of every child so that we take that, that, that financial burden away from the family. So we've seen this as a, a, a real um, community builder. We've also seen this as a huge um, um, catalyst to building the bands and orchestras that are in existence in our region. So being that that is not a concern anymore, um, we do take instrument donations. So if you have an instrument in your attic or basement and you're not planning on playing it anymore, we'll take that. If we're able to fix it, we will. And then with each contribution, we can also purchase a brand new one of choice. So it's a twofer. Um, and we're, we're more than happy to take all of those. Our inventory is, um, stays at the Tippecanoe Arts Federation. In addition to that, for some of the instruments that are beyond repair, we take those out on the road with us. So we provide the instrument petting zoos for such community events like the lollipop concert that just happened last week. So our, um, our teachers, our board members will go there and they'll, they'll um, expose the young people with all of the instruments and those young people try to make a pleasant noise um, out of one of the instruments, which is quite difficult for some <laughs> as well as me. I'm really, I'm really bad at, the, at anything that you have to buzz your lips for because it tickles. Uh, in order to provide the access that we have in Tippecanoe County to the other 13 counties that we serve, we've started the Visiting Artist Program. So we take our gifted and talented member organizations and artists, identify a need for discipline within the 13 counties that are not as fortunate as we are in terms of resources. And so communities, libraries, and um, Communities, libraries, and schools are the recipients of an artist for a, up to a three-week period where the teacher who is there can get that professional development for his particular discipline, as well as the young people can have a one-on-one -on -one experience with a trained professional artist in that discipline. So this has been a hugely successful program as well, but there is, continues to be a growing need. And finally, our mural art initiative, which was also started in 2008 um, as a way to combat vandalism that was specifically going on in downtown uh, Lafayette. And at the time, and it was right within the, the first few days of my employment with the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, and there was uh, local legislation that was passed that would basically cause a building owner to be fined for every day that they did, they did not remove graffiti or whatnot from their property. So Mayor Roswarski asked us if we would be able to help out, and so we did. We started the mural art, um, the mural arts initiative, and the first one was over um, right off of 9th Street, right by Waltz, um, and we did the bridge because that was getting heavily tagged. That program has grown now, so we were able to offer it to each of our 14 counties, and in more of a dedicated effort, we started art in rural places. And what we were able to do with that is merge the mural art program with the artists in residence or the visiting artist program to have an artist come in from out of town to work specifically with each of the community stakeholders, develop the subject matter, and deliver an, uh, an artwork for them. So we, we received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to implement this in three rural communities, and that, um, that included um, Rensselaer in Jasper County, Fowler in Benton, and uh, the last photo is uh, Tipton, so Tipton and Tipton County. In each of these counties, we're seeing a significant growth. You can see up there the silo was painted, and that, that, that took an effort to, to get the permission to, to paint that. Um, in, in total, each of these projects took over eight years of work to get the permissions, get the funding, and get it off the ground. So the two to three week period that the artist was there, um, which is what the community saw was fantastic and it was fast and it was very immediate. But all the work behind the scenes uh, did take quite a bit of time, but it was well worth it. And this project was so successful that we were um, asked then to help out the city of Lafayette in an area of town that has been traditionally burdened by um, crime and 
a bad reputation. So last summer, uh, very quickly, we put together a program so that we would be able to um, work directly in Wabash Avenue. And with the partners of Habitat for Humanity and the City of Lafayette, we were able to make those connections with the community, hold community meetings. They again brought together what was important to them about the neighborhood. And I found out a lot about the history of the Wabash Avenue neighborhood, which I'm sure you all have uh, some idea of the reputation that it held before. <clears throat> um, I do understand that that community was actually founded um, by uh, Scottish and Irish immigrants that came over to work and establish the Wabash and Erie Canal, and they stayed. And so the families that live there have been there for generations, and their homes are still there, and in between now and then, there was a lot of violence, and there was a lot of crime, and our efforts was to, were to rebrand and celebrate the assets that they, they still have. So instead of place keeping, or I'm sorry, instead of place making, which is a term that maybe some of you have heard, we're, we do place keeping, which celebrates the existing ac assets in a particular community so that we can, um, so we can provide some, some pride for each of those individuals. And this is a community that is very dedicated. We brought in 11 different artists from all over the world and they painted alongside each of the individuals that live in that community as well as some of the young people. And we're hoping that, that this will continue to grow that community's reputation in a positive direction. And as you know, it's a little difficult because it's bookended by Lafayette Sanitation on one side and then Lafayette Wastewater on the other. And in between there, there's Cargill, which they provide a lot of semi-traffic there. But there's a lot of residents there, so it, it, it's safe, but we need it to be, they need it to receive the love from the community, which I think they were lacking. So these are some examples of the murals that were done. This is actually on the Lafayette Sanitation Building. This artist that did this, his name's Andres, he's from Argentina. This is the first time he painted in the United States. And uh, again, he does photorealism. This is a, a portrait of a conductor. And if you get really close, you can see that there is a reflection of a train in his eye. So the trains are obviously really important to Wabash Avenue, and they wanted to make sure that they honored that. Mm. This was a mural that was done on the chip factory, so the original site for Oscar Winsky. It's, laid, um, it's been vacant for decades. And the, the building itself is in disrepair. Um, and it became one of the hottest locations for each of our artists. They all wanted to paint on this because it's an old building that's just beautiful. Um, Max Sansing, an artist from Chicago, painted this. It's called Firefly, which also coincided with the designation that the Firefly mm -hmm. was our, or is our state insect. So, and very nice that that also came from our local community. Uh, we had artists that were obviously up on this. This is. Uh, a portrait of the artist Finch. He's an artist that sometimes paints lately and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> but his stuff is known um, worldwide. He paints honey bears. And so you may or may not have seen those, but they are uh, fantastic. He's probably got the largest following of all the artists that we brought in. In total, each of our artists brought a cumulative total of 250,000 followers. Um, Instagram is a big thing for each of our visual artists. And we looked at that in terms of deciding on them. And the community or and residents of Wabash Avenue had the final say in which artists came out and then what they painted. So again, it was a great, great way to engage with the community and, and find out what really worked for them. And this was a unique dynamic of individual. Um, they had no problem working and spending time with the artists. And likewise, each of the residents would give them water, take them out to eat, give them a snack. It was really beautiful, and so this, this was probably one of the most successful projects that I have been fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, we also did some uh, assemblages. This is a piece that was done by our local artist, Zach Medler, and this is actually on the property of Sacred Grounds. This is the retaining wall that goes behind and enters into the Wabash Avenue neighborhood. We'll be working a little bit on this, but each one of the artists did one of the letters. So um, 
In terms of a culminating uh, part of the event, uh, we did a bike ride that took individuals from the community at large on a bike tour and explanation of each one of the artworks and what and what inspired them to become a piece of Wabash Walls. Um, as, as just a point of reference, I wanted to mention that the chip factory, which again has been vacant for decades and decades, uh, four months after we completed the project, that building was purchased. So um, we're also happy to report that in terms of um, our local economy and community development, uh, we've noted uh, that the median cost of a house was approximately $80,000 in Wabash Avenue. Today it sits at $120,000. So the arts really do have a dramatic effect and we knew that that was possible. We are very fortunate that the city of Lafayette had the confidence in us and in the arts to roll the dice and to see that this was a good decision and so much so that they have um, they have already approved Wabash Walls too. So, um, with this next one, I just want to show you a little bit video of how everything came together.